just for this uh, gathering. And I'll have to read that, but um, after that I'm going to talk. I'm going to take advantage and I'm going to talk about really what was it, what I enjoyed about spending so long with Goida. Uh, and it's titled Goida as Guide, an Inspiring Journey with a Practical Man. For 40 of the 64 years of South Australia's colonial history, George Goida was a leading figure. For much of that time, the preeminent expert in connection with nearly everything to do with land and the natural world, the entire biophysical realm of South Australia. He was, he was, as an editorial writer complained in the 1870s, the government's universal genius. For over 30 years, he was the Surveyor General, a position of uncommon influence and importance in South Australia, where the policy of survey before selection ensured that the Surveyor General actually oversaw the pattern of land use and planned the geographical layout of the colony. Not in complete isolation. It's no surprise then that he was the past president, he was a past president of the Royal Geographical Society and centrally involved in its founding. He had to give his apologies for not attending the initiating meeting in July 1885, but was inevitably elected in his absence as one of the six members of the Provisional Council. As Chief Justice of Samuel Way, who was the brother-in-law of a um, close friend of Goyders, Dr. Alan Campbell, told the meeting. He has been a practical explorer himself, and he has furnished most valuable advice and assistance to every person wishing to advance geographical science in a practical manner. There he is being practical, but that <coughs> was actually a satirical cartoon intended to make him look foolish when it was originally done. Way was not the first to describe Goyda as a practical man. The word invoked his direct and extensive experience of the country, along with his capacity to effect a grand plan through planning and mastery of detail, and his concern for both farmers and graziers for the realities of being on the land. And in relation to the indigenous people, and of course as Surveyor General, he was spearheading the effort to dispossess them. His principal concern was to, to take their land, was to take their livelihood, making the provision of alternatives and necessity as distinct from, say, wanting to convert them to Christianity. Practical also evokes his brisk manner when involved with work, although there was universal agreement that he would be courteous and charming when away from them, and his unwillingness to suffer fools gladly, or at all, if he had any choice. The provisional meetings of the society were held in Goida's office and 51 members were admitted. At the second general meeting, Sir Samuel Davenport was elected president. Goida submitted his resignation as Surveyor General in December 1893, ostensibly because of ill health, but actually because, behind closed doors, he was under attack from the Premier C.C. Kingston and his former minister, Goida's former minister, Thomas Blayford. As the lone voice of one parliamentarian summed up, Goida had been worried when ill into resigning. He ceased work at the end of 1893, although the resignation didn't take effect until mid 1894. In August 1894, the society elected him president, but his leadership was short lived. He retired because of ill health in April 1895. Poor health was not his only problem. The failure of the company with which he had made his pension arrangements meant that he had to undertake work as private surveyor and he had his property in the hills to manage as well. He died in 1898 at the age of 72. Eight years later, the then president of the Royal Geographical Society, Michael Williams, chose Goida as the subject of his presidential address. Williams, the author of the historical geography, The Making of the South Australian Landscape, had been a lecturer at the University of Adelaide for the past 17 years and became reader there. He retired as Professor of Geography at Oxford. William's paper, titled George Woodruff Goida, he, there's a mistake there that it was spelt the way um, that the brand of soft drinks were spelt, a practical geographer, not only took up the old saying, 
but amplified it in interesting ways. He identified Goya as one of the key colonial officials who were often very practical geographers in the sense that they made, or caused to be made, new geographies, new spatial arrangements and assessments of the landscape as an outcome of the very practical day-to-day -day administrative arrangements. As such, Goya could be seen to have had an effect on the emerging human landscape of Australia for over four decades. Williams contrasted these public servants with the celebrated and often much romanticised explorers whom he enabled impractical geographers almost consumed with a death wish in their effort to prove their heroism. <laughs> Williams estimated that he had read over three quarters of a million pieces of official correspondence in the course of his research and I was struck by the overwhelming predominance, influence and knowledge of Goida. The man is literally writ large over the correspondence and decisions of nearly four decades, so that land settlement in South Australia during those years is really the story of Goida. <coughs> the correspondence and the reports were unusually authoritative, knowledgeable and to the point. They were usually adopted without alteration as government policy. An observation I was able to confirm myself. I found myself reading a letter and I thought, oh, this is strangely familiar, even the layer. Then I realised it's what's known as the Stranways Act. Literally, it's printed literally as written without the salutations that make it a letter. When I began my research, William's paper was the best available source on Goyda's personal life and broader assessment of his career. And that's the paper my much loved copy of. It was a very important thing to me at one point. It convinced me that Goyda really was worth the time and effort the research would take. William's foundational research also made my own work possible because, along with the work of his fellow geographer Joseph Powell, the making of the South Australian landscape gave me a framework of understanding within which to begin work. William's determined inspection of the official correspondence was equally important. If he had not already undertaken this, I could not have begun. But setting out with Goyda was not all joy. The extraordinary range of his activities made fascinating but punishingly wide range of areas for background research. Originally trained as a railway engineer, which was how we acquired high level skills as a trigonometrical surveyor. And I'll just say as an aside, I once had a person say to me, oh, and he wasn't even trained as a surveyor, with a way, in a tone that suggested that this was something that people said. Well, it's true that he didn't have a piece of paper as a qualification, but that was because there were none. At the time that he trained, there were two routes to becoming a high-level surveyor. There were numbers of levels what called land surveyors who only surveyed the earth as if it were flat, flat plain, and trigonometrical surveyors who took into account the curve of the earth. It, the two routes were to join the Royal Engineers or to enter one of the professions as an article, to, or to be articled into one of the professions where it was required and taught, and railway engineering was one of them. So he was in fact properly trained. In any case, he quickly um, became Freeling, the Surveyor General's right hand man, and, and Freeling was um, a, a, a royal engineer, so I mean, he couldn't bluff his way past him, he, he had the skills. So he also developed the special skills of colonial surveying and was an explorer, capable bushman. He survived and so did his men. He was involved in planning the transport structure of the colony, roads, rail and stock routes, closely assessed a vast area for its pastoral potential, <coughs> leaving records of vegetation that are of value to this day, and created the first forest reserves, eventually establishing forestry in the colony. Although he was not alone in doing that, he was working with the German community in particular. In the face of the existence of a public works department, complete with a colonial engineer, he was put in charge of the drainage of land in the southeast. In addition to his formal roles of surveyor general, valuator of runs, and inspector of mines, and there were plenty of those, he established a team of men to bore for artesian water, eventually launching them as a separate department. 
Islam, of course. Yes. And this would have been taken in the late 1860s when repeated attempts to establish a colony in the Northern Territory had all failed. The task was given to Goida, and this is him as the leader of the number one in charge of that. In nine months for the hand-picked team of surveyors, he had selected and surveyed the site of Darwin and the surrounding lands. For a while, he even assessed patent claims. On the National News Now, weather in each state is presented in terms of local regional descriptions. In South Australia, these are the pastoral and agricultural areas. Major land use divisions first demarcated by Goida in 1865. The line he laid down, although ultimately intended by him to define the northern limit of agricultural land, first appeared as the southern border of the great 1865 drought, which actually ran from 1864 to 1867. And that was intended for use um, to demarcate out the area where pastoral relief would be given north of it. It was not public, the line was not publicly presented in the role for which it was intended until 1872, and it lasted in that role only two years. Goitman recognised a change in climate that made land unsuitable to agriculture, and it was not simply aridity. In 1864, he had begun to sketch out this boundary in his imagination, and in early 1865, he offered to clarify it to a parliamentary committee on land sales defining the limit of the agricultural land, in his own words, by means of the reliable rainfall. Goya had recognised that av annual average rainfall was a deceptive fiction over much of the continent. It was the seasonable reliability of rainfall that held the ecological key. Where high variability was the norm, it laid down its own special and very demanding challenges to life. To recognise variability as a norm itself, he had to step outside his culture with, a deeply rooted, with its deeply rooted assumptions about climate based on the realities of another culture, another continent, in another hemisphere on the other side of the planet. And not many of his contemporaries, it turned out, were able to move with him. And yet, so focused on variability was he that in describing his line of reliable rainfall, Goida did not even mention sufficiency of rainfall until 1881, and then only in passing for the sake of conceptual completeness. In addition to this, not only had Goida recognised an overwhelming but invisible environmental determinant, he had learned how to infer its presence and intensity from the landscape, in particular from the vegetation. It is normal, sorry, it is normal now to talk about rainfall variability. The ABC Rural Affairs Program Landline regularly provides graphs of the behaviour of the Southern Oscillation for the benefit of farmers. Goida's line, as it came to be called, unhelpfully because it expresses nothing of the line's meaning, is easy to understand. But it is worth remembering that as late as the mid 20th century, even a scholar of the calibre of the American historical geographer Donald Miney who spent a year in South Australia studying the wheat colonisation of the 1870s, could not determine what it actually represented. He was confident that the orthodox South Australian account of the time, that it was an approximation of an ISA high of average annual rainfall, could not be correct, since several different lines were offered and it did not seem to him to match any of them. He was forced to conclude that it was a clever, deceptive, but nevertheless personal construct of Goiter's, which is to say he had no real idea. The old map on which I first saw Goiter's line of rainfall was able to assure readers that the line was no ordinary line of rainfall, i.e. an average annual measure, but was not able to suggest what it actually could be. The first prediction of drought based on the behaviour of the El Nino Southern Oscillation System an understanding of which entails the recognition of high to extreme rainfall variability as the norm across much of the continent, was made in 1986, but the meteorologists kept their fears to themselves. 
the first public prediction was not made until 1991, either 1990 or 1991. The plants and animals of the island were not understood, inland, were not understood to be adapted to extreme rainfall variability until the 1970s. When Goiter attempted to map the change in rainfall reliability, he recognised in reality, ISA heights of average annual rainfall were still 50 years in the future, and ISA heights of seasonal variability more than 100. In the 1860s and 70s, the novel of what he was attempting was literally beyond comprehension. It is hardly surprising that the members of various government committees who listened to Goida's attempts to explain the problem with inland rainfall, that it was unreliable, uncertain and precarious, he tried all three, along with illustrations of his meaning, seem only to have taken away the understanding that the rainfall was poor or inadequate, judging by their comments. The clearest example is provided by John Henry Brown, the Scottish forester recruited by Goyden to head the new forest department. Brown believed that the presence of trees brought rain, a perfectly respectable belief at the time, especially in the context of the observation of loss of trees being followed by desertification. His plan was to plant trees north of corn and so bring rain to the inland. When Goida warned against this for the usual reason, Brown responded by changing his plan from planting seedlings to planting seeds, because the seeds would be able to wait for the rain. He did not grasp that the rain would continue to be unreliable and that the newly sprouted seedlings would die just as surely as the planted ones. Goida's prescience in identifying the character of the climate and the need to respond to it, his role in shaping South Australia and in establishing the Northern Territory made him, in my opinion, a figure of national significance. But his stories, there were so many of them, were not only demanding to research but a challenge to narrate. What was required was a narrative framework that was not driven exclusively by the passage of time, and that would allow each story to be told separately and coherently, at the same time allowing them all to be brought together as a whole. I was pathetically grateful when a reviewer finally appeared who had noticed this, understood the dangers of confusion and repetition that such a strategy posed, and commented favourably on their absence. And now I'm going to... Okay, so when you write a biography, you spend a long time with the person, and I spent a very long time with Koya. Um, one of the things that made it enjoyable was his intelligence, his curiosity, his capacities as a natural geographer. Someone who wrote to me after the book was published described him as that. It's not a phrase I could have used in writing, but I think it's an unconventional. Now, uh, Williams had already alerted me to his intelligence. Women, uh, Williams commented that you know, he seemed to stand head and shoulders over all these people around him. And I, um, initially, as I was reading, I, I was not familiar with, really, with reading a lot of 19th century letters and things. Didn't know the people who I was taking a while to get. But it became clear to me when I read the report, which had again in the form of letters, um, of his trip to the South East in 1863 with the Minister of Public or the Commissioner of Public Works, Mill, and the, um, the public, the colonial engineer, William Hanson. And uh, Mill asked them both to give um, reports on draining the South East. I think that was a good instigation. And Hanson produced a sort of laborious one where well, we could do this and we could do that. And, and I read it and I thought, that's the sort of thing I would do. And then I read Goiter's. And it was less than, it's about a page. And it simply said, well, let's take a bird's eye view of the country. Now, this is country that was very hard to see from above in those days. It's difficult to travel over. He correctly recognised that it was a series of um, hills which are all coastlines, all running parallel. He said, you know, the way to drain it simply is to cut across them. I mean, I personally am horrified by the whole idea of draining natural landscape like that, but that was the way people thought. 
But I realized then, as, as I compared the two documents, um, I could see that there were two orders of geographical intelligence operating that Reuters was by far the highest. He was also very curious, and you know, there were records in his notebooks of him trying out um, experiments on the beach to filter water. I mean, doomed experiment, he not even mind a little bit of science, let me, could let me see that it was going to be doomed, but he tried, was trying them out. And it was also very clear that he loved the country and was endlessly curious about it. As you read his notebooks, <coughs> he makes no damning comments. You get so used to the sort of um, colonial things about, you know, dreary wastes and monotonous what have you. And he just describes it as it is, no comment, no criticism, endlessly fascinated. I found two critical comments. One was uh, when he was at the back of Fowler's Bay on the country there, he nearly died of thirst. And he did describe that as a hopeless country, but I, I think that was in relation to his own experience. <laughs> And um, in the valuations, which are huge books of endless descriptions of, of landscape, close, close observations of landscape, mm -hmm. there's one reference to some weak and useful, useless herbage. Mm -hmm. And that's it. The rest of it is all just as it is. And when he visited the Flinders Ranges in 1857, it's clear from his field notebooks that he, you could just feel the joy coming off the page, that he was just exhilarated. And um, I could certainly identify with that. The interesting thing was it was easy to see where this came from. He had an unusual family background. His father, who I'd love to talk about but can't, but you can look him up on the internet. Um, David Go George Goyer, uh, wrote an, he wrote an autobiography. He was a most unusual man. He was very tiny, which also, um, Goyer was a bit taller, but um, his father was very small. He became a Swedenborgian minister, so this was an unusual religion to hold at the time, and he also um, established and ran Pestalozzi schools. So Goethe grew up in a household where it was used to a quite normal to hold unconventional opinions, but they, were, they weren't um, objecting to their society at all. They weren't uh, in rebellion, they simply held unusual opinions. And Swedenborg was also a scientist. So although this was a religious uh, belief with a very strong focus on the other world, Swedenborg is famous in Sweden as a scientist and he's highly honored there. And so he would have presented to Goethe as a young person a model of someone who was interested in this you know, um, mining and biology um, right across the, the spectrum. The Pestalozzi school thing, um, going to appear, his mother also helped the father doing that. He appears to have spent his early life in that school. Pestalozzi's theory was about, um, his motto was hands, heart and head. I think that's the right order. But the point was, it wasn't all about rote learning. It wasn't what you think of as 19th century education that children sort of lined up and terrorised. In fact, uh, this was very much a reaction. Goethe's father, David, had, had experienced that kind of education at Westminster School. <coughs> so Goethe would have been brought up in, in a way that encouraged his, ed, um, encouraged his intelligence and his curiosity. And his father also had a horror of uh, corporal punishment because he had been on the receiving end of it. And he thought that it caused lying and dishonesty in children because they became too frightened to admit when they'd made a mistake. And that was a very strong thing. And it's very noticeable with Goethe that he always did admit when he had made a mistake. And he did make a very big one early in his career. He was the person who drew attention to the fact that it was a mistake. And it didn't put him off. He wasn't ashamed. A lot of people would be take a step back, you know, having been so publicly shamed as he must have been. People were very angry. Um, he just carried on. That religious background too would all, was also behind, I think, his commitment to the public interest, because in the Swedenborgian religion. 
meditation and that sort of thing isn't the way to go. The way to go is to work for the common good and to build up connections with other people to be involved. And that's what you carry over with you into the next life. That's how you build the life of heaven in, in Swedenborg's language. And I should also add that David, um, his father, his father, taught kindness to animals. And when I was um, considering goiter as a subject, I mean, at the very beginning, you're trying to work out what your character, the character of the person you're dealing with is like, how far you should trust them. Um, because it's a big investment that you make working with that person. You want to know if they're really worthwhile. And one of the witnesses for Goida that I paid a lot of attention to was a horse. There's an incident in the Darwin survey. They arrived up there and the horses were being landed. Goida went off and left the men to do it, um, including sailors. And they drowned one of the horses. And he was furious. They, they, um, had, they were using what they call a halter. It was actually a lasso to start they got this poor animal into the water and throttled it. And he rode out um, and told them, gave them a big telling off. But later on, he saw they were doing it again. So he got into a boat, rode out, got onto the ship, released the horse. And it doesn't explain anything about how he did all of this. The horse must have been in a state of panic. He got the horse to jump overboard and swim behind his rowboat back to the beach. And I thought, that horse must have known him, it must have trusted him, and it must have decided that it was better off casting its lot in with him than staying on the ship with the people who were trying to throw it. So <laughs> I decided, yes, that was, he must be a good person. <laughs> so it was able, easy to trace how he sort of became the person that he was um, in terms of the uh, skills that he bought and the, the mental skills and more. The really exciting thing about him, but it was the most frightening at the beginning, was that I knew nothing about his early life. And realising that um, what he had done, how he done it. So, uh, my, one of my favourite pieces of advice is in Alice, in Alice where we're looking at us, where the king tells the court, um, or someone is reading, he says, begin at the beginning, go on to the end, then stop. <laughs> So it started off when he arrived in Australia and that took me a while to find. He actually had landed in Melbourne, uh, the records were incomplete, but that's actually by the way. He chose to come overland to South Australia. The usual route at the time was by sea because the overland route hadn't been marked down and it involved travelling through what was called the 90 mile desert, which is a, a, water, um, a waterless stretch of Mallee. So, I don't know. I don't know how he did it. Um, and as I made a point in the book, you can't even be sure that he could ride a horse because he was not well to do. He came out as a, um, his father was poor, uh, Ernest but poor, and he Goya himself came out on a bounty ship. I don't know. Where was that around? Um, so his family wouldn't have been able to afford to keep a horse. I doubt that he could have. His father certainly couldn't ride, he says so, in his autobiography. So presumably Boyd would have had to learn to do that. And my, I imagine he would have developed his skill riding to South Australia. In 1851, at the time that he was on the road, there was a huge bushfire in Victoria. It was one of the, the big ones that really convulsed the whole state. Um, and that's an enormous pain. That's why, unfortunately, you can't see much of it. There because it would be about, it's almost the length, the width of this room. It's huge. And it shows a, a stampeding horde of, horde of um, horses, cattle, wild animals in the face of the flames. So he, he can't have avoided that. It also was in South Australia. Um, if he was lucky, so that would have introduced him to the idea that the, the lands, the country he could be quite. He would have also passed through the Western District and seen the pastoral country, which was um, famous at the time. People, it was, uh, people were amazed at the number of sheep they could get onto it. And then he would have had to pass through the, the, the desert. So by the time he arrived in Adelaide in 
March 1851, something like that. That was taken in the year, I think. Um, he would have learned quite a lot. He got a job in with the colonial engineer, but that only lasted to the end of the year. But he did manage to get married. And that's his first wife on the left, Frances, and her sister, Ellen, who became his second wife. That's much later. And in 1852, he took over as the secretary, he got a job as the secretary of the Adelaide Exchange, um, which was a land exchange, business exchange. And at the end of that year, he applied for a job with the survey department. And he said that he learned a great deal about the land as the secretary of the exchange. Now, um, under Colonel Freeling, he quickly became the right hand man, as Freeman put it, and he was in charge of the, the, the survey. That's from the South Australian Survey Department, equipment from the 19th century. Um, he quickly started to give feedback and act, also act at times as acting surveyor general and so on. He was at first in the clerk's office, uh, the chief clerk in the land office, but then he was uh, quickly went out into the field and was soon in charge of the field surveys. And he began to, to um, send back um, advice about how to do that. In particular, he wanted the examination um, of the land before survey uh, made much more a feature and, and more developed, which means that's what he was doing. So he was spending years, most of the time he was out in the country, riding around, observing the land, noting things off on the chain. And, by 1857, he was still, he was effectively Deputy Surveyor General, but not formally so. And he did his first exploration in the north. That's a map from 1851, and it shows Lake Torrens, as it was then called, which is all of the whole Salt Lake Basin, which they believed to be one huge lake. Salt Lake, and it was believed to be virtually impassable. So he went up into the Flinders Ranges to do surveying there, and was allowed to explore his first bit of exploration beyond it. And he came across Lake Blanche in flood. And as a newcomer, he misread the cues. There were cues in the landscape that he mentions in his um, in his field notes, particularly the trees becoming sparser and smaller and more stunted, and then dying away altogether as they approach the water and so on. But because of the lushness of the um, vegetation around the water, he reported it as permanent water. There was jubilation in Adelaide, a land rush from Sydney and Adelaide and um, Melbourne and other places. People wanted to take this up as pastoral country. That was in the middle of the year, and then in September he received a letter from was up there saying, oh, the water's died up. And Goya wrote to the register and drew that to their attention. So, which was, must have taken a bit of courage, I think. And this was the end. In the meantime, his boss, the Surveyor General Frehley, had gone up to there with two boats and they'd lugged them up through the Flinders Rangers and they were going to explore the water in the north. Oh, that's another, you can see the lake a bit better. And there they are doing that. This is a cartoon in Melbourne Punch, Mr. Gorgeous Discoveries. It's actually, when I looked in the papers at the time, they didn't rub his nose in it publicly, but there was a, a comment from someone that people were very angry, and I'll bet they were. But um, the pastoralists that went up there, incidentally, ended up being quite glad because they discovered that salt bush makes good fodder, which wasn't quite known then. So Goethe's first um, venture into exploring and also into becoming a public figure was anything but a success, as it appeared. In the following year, but of course he was actually 
although he couldn't have known it, he was actually encountering what really happens. In the following year, he went as a guide with um, Selwyn, the geologist who uh, Victoria had employed to mark out the gold fields. And he had sort of top rate skills and he brought over what were then the new skills of systematic observation. And he taught Goida about how to do geological observation. And Goida already had the skill of systematic observation along the line for surveying purposes. But Selwyn would have um, strongly increased, he would have brought him up to date technically, really, with um, a sort of an approach to scientific <laughs> observation, I guess. And Goida was clearly grateful. In the year after that, at this point, they went into another drought. It, it became the worst, at that point, the worst drought that uh, the colonists had experienced. And Goida offered to go, um, well, he applied to go north at the end of an expedition to um, triangulate the country south of Lake Eyre for the pastoralists. He did that because he wanted the money. Um, while he was up there, they were there for quite a long time, 18 months, and he saw that drought break. And he saw the flooding, he saw creeks fill, he saw Lake Air with water in it, the birds come, the vegetation change, he even made a little coracle out of um, hides, and they boated down into Lake Air, which I thought was quite interesting. And although he didn't mention it at the time, what he also saw was something that he must have made a huge impression on him, because he mentioned it in the 1890s, and he saw Aboriginal people during the drought breaking their camp because they'd seen um, <coughs> rainfall, thunderstorms on the horizon, and they were going towards them. And he said he realised that this was a nomadic country, that you had to, you had to adjust to the rainfall, you had to go where it was an act when it was available. And, but of course he did he couldn't come back to Adelaide and say, oh it's beautiful, I've seen more water in the inland because of what he'd already done. And he sort of kept that to himself. And because the paper that it was reported in is the parliamentary paper was just called Mr. Gordon's Trade Relations in the North and the parliamentary papers are not well indexed. That was completely forgotten. Um, I happened upon that virtually by accident. Um, so now, within two years, he was the only colonist to have seen the inland flood twice and to see it in drought and to see the way the country changes, which makes him virtually unique. There might have been companions with him, but. As a, as a person with a position of responsibility. In 1862, he travelled to the west, in 1863, down into the southeast, and then in 1864, he was given the task of valuing the runs to save the government's some um, bacon, basically. They needed valuing rapidly, and um, they didn't know what to do. And he did it with his usual extro extreme thoroughness at great cost to himself. And rather than just sort of make assessments, I mean, one of the possibilities they were talking about was even just having the pastoralists to value it themselves. And I presume we thought that probably was the good thing. But Goyne decided to go out, and he, he's left for each run. There's a little map, and there was a route marked all over it where he zigzags back and forth, checking it out. And he made regular observations along the line, every quarter of a mile, every half mile, about vegetation and water, and those records still exist. And he was also able to talk to squatters. And it was in the course of that that he seems to have come to realise that reliable rainfall ended at a certain point, and that you could identify that point. That was his initial guess at what his line might look like. When he spoke to the um, <coughs> group in 1865, because the pastoralists wanted the line too. They wanted it for a quite different reason. They wanted it for drought relief. Um, but some of them also, who were on that committee, wanted to know the limit of the agricultural land, because pastoralists beyond it could then 
know that their land wouldn't be resumed for agriculture and could invest more money into the, into the um, property. But while it was at risk of resumption, they wouldn't. So they were keen to know. And that was what he sort of outlined to them as he spoke. But then the drought deepened and he went out to do the 1860. So he rode all around the central country there and came back with his line. But of course the line covers the whole state. So clearly, to describe the line as a drought margin, as has been done, um, can't possibly be correct. <laughs> so, but the striking thing about him was, uh, what, what amazed me was that he was such an open-minded observer. He was, wasn't blinded by his culture. He wasn't diverted from what he saw by other people's expectations. He stuck to what he saw. Um, and I was also impressed by the way events came together. South Australia was, is the driest state in Australia. In the 1860s, it was a time when, 1850s, 1860s, was a time when, before real specialisation, so Goya was, in, certainly in the 1850s, was just regarded as a scientific gentleman. That was the phrase they used at the time, and that was good enough. It wasn't until much later, like in the 70s and so on, that you get more intense um, specialisation. So in the 1860s, it was um, OK for him to be doing that. So. And his particular requirements and the particular requirements of a South Australian surveyor, surveyor general all sort of came together. And it's really a kind of perfect storm of interesting events that um, produced the line. Now, this is a bit, the third thing that I put down about what I got from being with him is going to sound a bit odder. First of all, observation. Um, and the connection, interestingly, with attention and love. Because he observed changes in the vegetation, I sort of started to attend myself, and I was invited to do the same thing. I had the disadvantage that I didn't know the names of most of the species I was looking at, but I didn't make names up. And in my attempts to do it as I was travelling around, I was writing things down, and I quickly realised that my notebooks looked exactly like Goethe's. They were just lists, pages with lists of species. And I thought, oh. But as I kept doing it, it started to become a bit boring, then suddenly I realised, oh no, I'd go to write something else, the usual suspects, that, 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 oh no, that one's not there. And I, while it's not so much what's recorded on the page that's important, but the act of recording it that causes you to observe. And then I thought, oh, that explains his notebooks, because someone had said to me, what about his later notebooks? And the person had been almost suggesting, you know, was he a bit touched or something? And they just consist of pages and pages of um, that sort of observation in pretty untidy handwriting. And I thought, no, he was, he was doing the raw work. Because you go with him from these notebooks to a very finished product, but it's that work of observation that gives you the ob of raw observation that gives you the observations in the sense of um, things that you've noticed, which you can then work up into the further material. So I learned the importance from him when I realised that my notebook looked like his in a crude sort of way. I realised the importance of writing things down and, knowing, and giving things names. Now, uh, People at the time commented what a, that he was such an astute observer, he was highly perceptive, almost uncanny, da da da. He just had very focused attention. Um, oh, one of the phrases was his usual close attention. That's. And I read something, it was sort of connecting up in my mind with things, and then I read, um, I was actually reading a Anne Mann, and she refers to Robert McFarlane, the English, um, no, sometimes called, he certainly writes about the environment and nature writer. And he was referring to Iris Murdoch's so essays and sort of many removes, but talking about attention in relation to the natural world as an especially vigilant kind of looking, 
and the most basic and indispensable form of moral work because it teaches us how real things can be looked at and loved without being seized and used, without being appropriated into the greedy organism of the self. And that connected up too because I had been thinking along those lines, but in relation to Goya, it connected up because he did use, when he talked about people, settlers, he talked about people become fond of the land. It was very obvious from his own writings that he was fond of it. And he used, um, in speaking of the Aborigines, he said they love their country. And he actually used the word love. You know, and it's not something I saw in anyone else's writings. And I thought, yeah, I just felt that that was a little group that went together. Now, this is a bit more. So as I was working with him, I was marveling at him from a distance. Um, I was, the, the range of his activities, but also his willingness to undertake responsibility, um, not just in terms of his work, but his family. He had lots of people who, he had a large family himself, many children. Poor Frances, who you saw at the beginning, had as many children as she possibly could, in, you know, until virtually she died. Um, some of those children had illnesses. It's not really clear what they were. What, um, clearly one of them had was, I think, nearly blind. But he also had other members of his family, um, some members of the Smith family early on. He just had very big shoulders. But when I started out with him, I could sort of find those things out, but I couldn't get any personal records. There were just official letters, you know, your, your humble and obedient servant and um, parliamentary papers. And I was starting to despair that I would ever hear his real voice until one day I was in the State Library and I saw a shelving trolley and librarianship is a field in which someone once commented that serendipity is a technical term. But serendipity helps those who help themselves. And I had to have it. If it was a shelving trolley, I ran my eye over it. If it had anything about colonial South Australia, I just picked it up automatically and checked the indexes and the contents. This was uh, a book by a couple, a married couple, whose surname was Jensen, and it was about colonial architecture and I picked it in South Australia, picked it up, looked at the index, good. <laughs> and they had been reading through the newspapers and had found accounts of a shipwreck in which Goyer had been involved. And although it wasn't at all germane to their subject, they were so delighted to have found this that they included it in the book just and just because they couldn't let it go unremarked. And I was so excited and found these things. And he'd written to the register and the advertiser because he'd travelled to um, after he came back from Darwin and he received the tragic news of his wife's death. And that's a, a really terrible story, but I can't go into it here. He took leave to travel on the new wonder ship. It was the fastest ship to ever get to Australia. It was the talk of the town. You know, it was a major thing. It's called, she was called the Queen of the Thames. And she got to Sydney in 54 days, I think it was. So he proposed that he was going to go back to England and travel on the Queen of the Thames, and he would provide Apparently, had arranged to provide accounts, accounts with the age and um, the advertiser and the register. But what happened on the Queen of the Thames was that the captain and his officers were drinking wine with the people downstairs, having a sing song, and generally all enjoying themselves. Nobody paid really close attention. They missed a beacon light that told them that they were approaching South Africa. They failed to turn the man on shore. And Goida sort of knew that this was going to happen, that they hadn't turned at the right spot. Um, and he wrote a very long account that I was, of course, thrilled because the first time I could hear his own voice 
Admittedly, it was a public voice, not a private one, but um, dealing with a very personal event. And I certainly heard the satire that I expected. I, I'd worked out that he had a fairly sharp tongue. I just, you could just feel it sometimes. And um, he was famous for getting the cross. Um, so he had, had a very serious go at the captain and eventually went to court about that. But there were some, also some really touching things there. When he realised that they were going to run aground, he said, he discussed this with some other people, wished them well, and went to his room to, to get as much sleep as he could. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't even contemplate sleeping in those circumstances. And then after they did, he was woken up when they ran aground, and he went up on sh up on deck immediately, and he put out life jackets all around the thing so that if people needed them, they were already out and ready to use. When they went to shore, and he was in the third boat ashore, he immediately got some men and went off looking for fresh water because they didn't really know where they were. Um, it's all so typical of him and. Um, Quite touching, I thought. There was also a passage where he revealed his vulnerability, which does come out from time to time. The ship's captain was drunk, uh, came drunk, but the ship's doctor was habitually drunk. <laughs> Apparently, it, 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 he was very good when he was well. <laughs> And Goida hadn't realised this, and he said, you know, men with large responsibilities, men with large families, and, and clearly talking about himself, you know, trust these people, and we buy, we book passengers for our children on ships based on trusting these people, and then we see what they're really like. And I thought, like, oh, yes. Anyway, so that was that. Was that. I had this wonderful long passage um, to read. And the next one was even more. This is him as an old man towards the end. As I was finishing the work, I finally thought, I'd read through the list of what's in the, obviously, in the archive here. And there was something called a diary from 1893. Well, that was the year he retired. And he didn't keep diaries. He, I, I knew that. I mean, he was just too busy. He didn't do anything twice. He never wasted them. Um, an ounce of his energy or time. And I thought, oh, the diary, there was no notes about it. And in the end, I thought, look, I better look at this diary. I, you know, I'm here and I can't not look at it. I mean, it's a mistake of completeness. I asked it to be brought and looked at it. And there it was. It was very much the kind of diary you can still buy. It was a lens, you know, a week to a page, fool's cap. Hardly touched. It looked as if it had never been opened. And that didn't surprise me. You know. What, what's it doing here? So I opened it up and started to find a few little entries and just really cool writing. And I couldn't make them out. But it was clear because the names, it was all about this person and that person. And, but I, I certainly can read now as King's, um, look, the, the Chief Secretary, the Minister. And I could see he was in trouble and he was very worried. I think he kept the diary because he was worried he was going to be brought before a court or some kind of um, committee of inquiry, accused of having obstructed the Crown solicitor in the course of his activities. And so he so he better have the diary ready. But um, <coughs> I had to then go and sort of read the papers and work out what the mention of sort of was able to understand the backstory and see what was happening. And yeah, he was being threatened. Cameron didn't like people who opposed him and he thought that um, oh, there'd been a problem with some leases and, and Cameron wanted the leases resumed but he was not able to get that. The court ruled against him. And Cameron accused Goya, first of all, of giving information to the squatters of the passports and Goya said, yes, I did. I wouldn't give that information to anyone. And when he first applied for his job of um, evidence, the, the chief clerk in the land office, before he was anywhere near Spain, he said that providing information to the public was important. 
So that's uh, certainly true. And he also said that he passed on information to the Crown Solicitor as soon as it reached his desk, but he was very worried and he was clearly not well, so he just bowed out, I think. Um, but when I realised and understood that, I thought, why was that um, diary preserved? He could easily have taken it with him. Um, given that this, what was going on behind closed doors, well, obviously it was not made public, it was that one voice in the parliament that um, exposed it. But the press went along with the line that, oh, you know, what a terrific fellow he was, and so on. There's no problems. Did he ask for it to be put there too? Or I also thought it was quite possible that a loyal clerk, you know, a loyal um, subordinate, knowing what had going on, what was going on, had deliberately had it put away. Anyway, I did realise, I thought, I, I think since this was written and put away, I'm the first person to have opened it and understood finally what it's about. And um, at that point, I did sort of feel close to him and uh, uh, I had some sense of closeness or connection with him. He was Lionel G, a man who owed him quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Lionel G was a surveyor, but again, in the confidential letter book, Lionel G was found to be drunk on duty one day when he was, the, I think, the chief clerk, mm -hmm. and Goiter wrote letters to the commissioner, really begging that he not be sacked and that he be just transferred. And, and Goiter spoke to his wife, and they thought, mm -hmm. if they sent him down to the southeast where it was quiet, maybe, you know, if he took the pledge, everything would be all right. Um, so, G.O. Goyer, and he said he was very courteous and kind to young men and helped young men on their way. But G also said that Goyer was a terrific companion when he travelled, to travel with. He always had stories and um, he was not only a good storyteller but a good listener. And I certainly found him a tremendous um, companion on my journey with him, so thank you. Thank you.